Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming to listen to me, and thanks to uh, AFWorks for inviting me to speak. I'm going to be talking about large-scale geospatial analysis. This might be the first example of large-scale geospatial analysis. It's especially interesting on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. It was really only when we sent Apollo 8 to orbit the moon that we actually got far enough away to look back at the Earth and see it in one camera frame and, and started really thinking about the Earth as a thing that you could study, a thing you could understand, and a thing you could indeed take care of. Now, now the good news is we got far enough away from the Earth to see it all at once. The challenge is that in that picture, each pixel is about 10,000 square kilometers. So unless you're studying something really big, like hurricanes or, or, or continental scale desertification, you're really not going to be able to use that image. On the other extreme, if you look at this background image, this is the port of Rotterdam. And, and here, this is a contemporary high-resolution commercial satellite image. Here you've got all kind of stuff you can study. You can see the port activities. You can see the shipping containers. You can see the ships. You can see the trucks. You can look at crop yield. You can look at imports. You can look at exports. You can look at consumer behavior. The problem with this image is that if you want to look at the Earth at this scale, you actually would need 8 million people doing, all, doing nothing all day, every day, but looking at satellite imagery. So you've got the choice between seeing the whole Earth and not being able to tell anything that's going on, or seeing the details and not being able to see the forest, quite literally. The problem is only getting worse as commercial space has been taking off. So we've now got multiple providers around the world from different countries using different technologies building fleets of satellites that are able to essentially photograph the whole Earth every other day at this point in three to five meter resolution with, with tremendous numbers of new constellations on the drawing board. And that's on top of the national assets that multiple countries have. So we essentially, what we end up doing is dropping a lot of this imagery onto hard disks or tape drives and no human ever looks at it. And it's, and it's somewhat useless, arguably, to put a satellite in orbit and take an image that nobody looks at, because it could have a man from Pluto on it and you wouldn't know um, that it's on the image. So the approach that we use at, at Orbital Insight is to, is to leverage the growing power of AI. So if you look at what can be done with deep learning, um, it has moved amazingly over the last five to 10 years. So I did a PhD at AI about 20 years ago. Back then, you know, we all loved it. We were, we were deeply committed to understanding the nature of intelligence and doing you know, academic research on the subject. But if you tried to actually do something with it, you know, actually count cars or actually identify cars versus trucks, it was hopeless. You would, you'd make a couple images work for a research paper and as soon as you tried to scale it up, nothing worked. That all changed very dramatically with deep learning. So we're now able to do building detection road detecting, truck detection, car detection, land use detection, um, 50 plus different algorithms um, for satellite and drone imagery um, just within just within Orbital Insight alone. Um, and with not perfect, you know, you always make mistakes, so it's not perfect accuracy, not perfect precision and recall, but extremely high. So we'll do projects in the commercial sector like we're tracking every housing development in the US, new, new foundations, new frames, new roofs. We're tracking every retail parking lot in the US, 300,000 parking lots, um, counting cars in those parking lots every time we get a satellite image and updating the numbers for our hedge fund clients. Um, we're tracking every floating little oil tank in the world, 25,000 oil tanks, and we can tell you what's going on with Saudi oil, what's going on with oil in China, what's going on with oil in Cushing in the US, as well as land use change for both commercial government and NGO customers. So it's really a brave new world with what can be done with AI, and especially when you couple that with, what can, with the growing availability of commercial satellite imagery. So the picture that emerges here is we're starting with this rich set of input data. So it's Landsat imagery, Sentinel imagery, it's imagery from Maxar, Airbus, Planet, um, drone imagery from multiple providers. We work in certain cases behind the firewall on, on government imagery as well as commercial imagery. And then other sources. There's a, there's a growing body of Internet of Things data, um, connected car data from cars that are continuously pinging back to their, uh, the company that owns them, um, cell phone data. There's a lot of permissioned, non-classified commercial cell phone data that is basically anonymized counts of cell phones by location. 
obviously AIS data, all the ship tracking data. So, so all of that is in some sense, from our point of view, that's like, that's like steel and we're making cars, right? So all of that is our raw material. And we're interested in the AI and the data science to, to pull that together and generate insights, generate some new understanding of the world at scale um, for our customers. And this work um, falls into several classes. One whole area is land use. And you might think of land use as just map making, and map making is really important, right? I mean, if you're going to go into an area, you want to know where the roads and buildings are, you want to know what's changed, you want an accurate, up-to-date map. Um, if you're interested in a, in a border area or perhaps an unstable area, understanding where new airports are being built, where new roads are being built is important. On the commercial side, we work with companies that are working on self-driving cars or mapping um, for autonomous mapping to tell them just where the roads are. A lot of parts of the world, the roads are growing, the road networks are growing and changing so quickly that just the land use of updating those roads is valuable. Second broad area is object detection. So I mentioned earlier cars, but anything that moves and is large. It turns out that shipping containers, trucks, cars, and rail cars are all about the same size. And once you get imagery below about a meter in resolution, you can accurately count all of those objects. So you can get car traffic, rail traffic, um, shipping containers and ports, truck traffic. The biggest limitation on the object detection size is that resolution of imagery, that meter resolution of imagery, is not currently available on a daily basis. So we can get the five meter imagery for land use change on nearly a daily basis. We cannot yet get the sub-meter imagery. And that will be, people often ask me, what's going to change this industry? And it will be when somebody actually launches a constellation that gives me sub-meter imagery on a daily basis. Then I can do daily cars and trucks and rail cars and shipping containers. <clears throat> and then the third area is, is other kinds of geolocation. So the cell phone counts, the AIS data, the connected car data. I'm going to talk about a few specific applications um, that, are, that are particularly relevant to this community um, that we've worked on with, with various customers and partners. So one whole area that's really interesting is indications and warnings. So the idea here is you have a, you have a limited number of human analysts. Um, I mean, obviously, everybody always wants more, but you're never going to get a budget for 8 million human analysts. So you're always going to have fewer human analysts and you have places you want to look. The idea is to make those human analysts as valuable as possible and have them look in the places where it's most likely that something interesting is happening. So in one case, we took imagery from five different commercial providers covering a period of about four or five years, um, and we ran car detection, truck, de truck detection, ship detection. We did, some, we did some calculations, having some humans test run a few of these, and the calculations we did would have taken 40 person years of human effort to do the object map, do the object counting in this entire uh, unstable region for the entire period using all the commercial imagery. We ran it over basically over a weekend, over a couple weeks. And then from that, we're then able to produce a pattern, a baseline pattern of life and say this is typically what happens on a Monday, this is typically what happens on a Tuesday morning, this is what happens in January versus February, um, this is what happens in the border region, this is what happens around this military base, this is what happens around this region that might be used for missile tests. And then you can use that as your baseline. And if something changes in a border region, something changes in an area that might be used for testing, that's an indication that a human needs to look. So you either task an asset or maybe just a human to look closely at the imagery and understand what's going on. It's a great use of AI um, because the human is making the final decision and doing the final analysis, but you're optimizing the use of those humans. Another broad area that, that we're really excited about is just looking at sim relatively simple things from an AI point of view. Um, but, but quite large, um, from a traditional point of view, we can look at all the airports in the world. Um, and we can get imagery of most of them every day because they're fairly well targeted. Um, so we can get counts by aircraft type, fighters versus bombers versus other kind of aircrafts of every airport, every airport and military base in the world. Given the multi-class aircraft detectors we've been building, it's a relatively straightforward application. We just, we just ran it. We have a platform now that's easily tasked by just giving it KML files for areas of interest. One of our solutions engineers tasked it on 300 airports, um, or 300 military bases around the world, and we now have counts of all the different aircraft type. It's a basic kind of data, but it's a kind of data that's incredibly expensive to produce without the AI, because it takes to do that every day takes a very large number of analysts. Another area that's, a lot, that's of a lot of interest for both commercial and government applications is import monitoring. 
Um, I've, I've seen it said in the commercial press that ports are the new manufacturing, uh, the new factories of the world. Because so much of the world's goods goes through ports, and we can detect vessels, ships, we can detect oil storage in port areas because most country, almost every country in the world has now oil storage tanks in port areas because they're almost all importing or exporting oil. Um, we can look at import-export lots. Um, we did a calculation looking at some satellite imagery. There was a, um, an explosion outside of Beijing a few years ago, um, and we did, an, we did a calculation. There's about $15 million worth of cars that were blown up in that explosion just by counting cars in the import-export lots right before the explosion. Um, so that's important for insurance companies as well as just for situational awareness of what's going on in these import-export areas. And then, of course, commodity stockpiles. Um, most countries import vast amounts of something or other, um, whether it's iron ore or whether it's copper ore or whether it's oil or what have you. As an extension of that, we can also look at marine domain awareness. Um, here we end up pulling in not only the visual imagery, but also the SAR imagery. So SAR is, is um, synthetic aperture radar. It, it has the advantage that it can actually look through clouds, because basically you're sending a radar pulse out of the satellite. It has a disadvantage that the satellites are a lot more expensive. They need a lot bigger solar panels, basically, because they have to provide their own power supply to beam this radar beam down to the Earth. Um, but when you're looking at the open ocean, it turns out that water absorbs radar and ships reflect it. So ships stand out very prominently, and you can see one of the, some of the images there on the upper right. Ships stand out like big stars in SAR. Um, <clears throat> so when we're doing marine domain awareness, we get very low-resolution, low large-scale SAR imagery, similarly for electro-optical imagery, run the detections in um, both modalities, and then subtra generally subtract out the AIS data. The, all ships that are running commercially, and here's a few examples of what ships end up looking like in, the, in this resolution. Ships are big enough that five meter imagery is fine. Um, so what we, end up, what we end up doing is we end up subtracting out the ships that are running the AIS beacons. All commercial traffic is required to run AIS. The only time somebody typically will turn it off, well there's a few cases, illegal fishing, um, blockade running, and uh, military vehicles. So it's a great way to find out the things that shouldn't legally be going on. You just simply subtract out the AIS from the ships that we can detect visually or through SAR. Um, we've run a number of these projects in different parts of the world, and this is an example of a quadrant by quadrant output of the density of ships over time that we were seeing um, with and without uh, AIS. I mentioned earlier the whole broad area of land use classification. Um, this, is, this is incredibly interesting because the world is always changing. Um, and by using a multi-class AI algorithm, we're able to find the roads, the buildings, separate urban areas from rural areas. We can even pull out detail area, detailed facets, like where there is mining activity going on. Um, we've done a lot of work with the World Resource Institute on separating planted forest from nat natural forest. Because what happens with the forest <coughs> is that periodically a managed forest will be cut down. That's basically the way you harvest the teak or whatever it is you're growing in the managed forest. That's not really deforestation. But if you can't tell the difference between planted and natural forest, you can't tell the difference between a typical harvest event and a true deforestation. You also can't tell whether or not a, an area, say a palm oil plantation, is being used sustainably or not. The definition of unsustainability is basically it was a, it was an, it was a natural forest five years or less ago. So you want to know how long ago it was a natural forest. So we can separate out planet, planted from natural forest. We can obviously pull out water. We can get very accurate lake levels um, anywhere in the world from the AI algorithms just running on the lakes. Um, and then the, the land use can actually go quite detailed. So I just wanted to show this, show this image. When you take these images and run them by eye up against the base satellite image underlying it, the roads are most of the time right. Every now and then you'll get gaps in the road, so it's not perfect. But usually if you take these things and flip them back and forth with an image, you'll see the roads are right, the buildings are right, the forests are right. Um, we're getting to the point where these algorithms are actually quite accurate for these basic things like roads and buildings. We can also do clever things when we have frequent imagery. We'll actually average the imagery over a period of days. So basically, if it looked like a road yesterday and it looks like a road the day before and it looks like a road today, chances are it really is a road. Um, and then we can use that, going back to indications and warnings, we can use that to detect change. 
So there didn't used to be a road here, there is now. If it's kind of wide, maybe it's an airport. There used to be a forest here, and now it's a bunch of fields. Um, if, it used to be, if it used to be open field and now it's uh, cleared in the US, it's probably a fracking pad. So we actually have a fracking pad detector to detect fracking activity in the US, um, which is actually also an interesting analog for certain kinds of military activities as well. So land use change is, is very often interesting. Final application I want to talk about as a particular kind of dramatic land use change, which is a hurricane. Um, this is an image from just after Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Um, at the time Hurricane Harvey came through Houston, we had a ha small handful of insurance customers we were doing R&D for. Had a bunch of proof of concepts of what could be done with flood detection and disaster response. Harvey hit, and they all said, drop whatever you were doing and just do Harvey. So we did a, we did a quick application on Harvey. We pulled in, both again, both um, visual imagery as well as SAR imagery, because as I mentioned, water absorbs SAR. You basically take a before and after SAR image in any place you used to get a return that now you no longer get a return is probably flooded. Um, and then we also have um, AI-based water detectors that work in visual imagery. And we were able to get flood extent, so that tells you water, no water across the whole city. Um, and in the case of Harvey, there was a lot of water. Um, and then we're able to get flood depth by using a digital elevation map. Basically, the idea is if there's water here and, you know, a couple blocks away, the digital elevation map says that spot is 10 feet lower than this spot, then over there the water is 10 feet deep. So we're able to use the water extent plus a digital elevation map to interpolate water depth. Um, we went back later to the federal data um, after Hurricane Harvey where they were looking at mud lines. And we were actually within a few feet most of the time in our depth for Harvey. Um, we're now doing this um, live, actually, with Tokyo Marine for uh, floods in Japan, as well as um, various activities um, with different parts of the government looking at what we can do with this. Um, so, so that's my quick summary. Like I say, I appreciate you all listening. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating time to be in this industry. Um, both because of the rapid growth of drone imagery as well as satellite imagery, all the different spectral bands and modalities we have available, as well as the AI and the data science that we can now use to actually bring this up to scale so that we can use the, the frequent imagery and the AI to literally see the whole Earth, count the cars, count the trees everywhere on the Earth, and do it all at once. So we get the big picture like the Apollo image of the whole Earth, but we can also see all of the detail. So thank you very much for listening.